So uh, welcome everyone. Um, I am Sylvia Gottesman. Uh, I'm a dermatologist and dermatopathologist uh, at Northwell Health, uh, assistant professor of dermatology and pathology at the Zucker School of Medicine on Long Island. And um, I have my co-host here with me today, Dr. Jisun Cha, which I will allow to introduce herself. And I will um, uh, introduce our guest, um, guest of the hour, Dr. Alejandro Gru. Uh, he's a hematodermatopathologist extraordinaire. He's an associate professor of pathology and the dermatopathology section and fellowship program director at the University of Virginia School of Medicine. A um, couple of weeks ago, we had a very vibrant dermatopathology online journal club on Twitter, and we were fortunate to have him attend. And there was so much interest for a post journal club Q&A session. Uh, so uh, here we are, and we're going to talk about a secondary skin involvement in classic Hodgkin's lymphoma. Dr. Cho. Hi, um, nice to meet you, everyone, uh, especially Dr. Gansman and Dr. Guru. Uh, my name is Jisun Cha, and um, I'm a dermatologist and dermatopathologist at the Schweiger Dermatology Group, and I'm a medical director of the dermatopathology laboratory there. Um, I, I'm very excited to uh, discuss with Dr. Gru about Hodgkin's lymphoma, which is one of the most common B-cell lymphoma with um, bimodal distribution in young adults and patients older than 55. There have been many therapeutic advances over the last couple of decades, but diagnosis and staging of Hodgkin's lymphoma remains of paramount importance. The cutaneous involvement of Hodgkin's lymphoma is known to be extremely rare, so this article will be very important reference to many pathologists. So Dr. Gru, I have um, the first question. So what is the overall implication of cutaneous involvement in Hodgkin's lymphoma? Does it change the prognosis or therapeutic plan for the patient? Yeah, so that's, you know, that's a great question. Let me start by uh, saying what an honor it is to uh, be invited to this talk with, with Dr. Gottesman and you, Dr. Cha. It's uh, such an honor and it's a, uh, uh, you know, it's uh, an, an amazing uh, privilege to, to, to be discussing this uh, paper. Um, so uh, on, on one thing, I want to start by saying um, that my first exposure with cutaneous Hodgkin's happen, happened when I was a resident in pathology and, um, and had a case that was proposed to me to, to sort of get involved in the write-up mm -hmm. of a young patient who was in the 30s and she had essentially advanced Hodgkin lymphoma, had a bone marrow transplant and then relapsed with multiple lesions um, and had um, not only involvement by Hodgkin's lymphoma, but also melanoma. And, and that was really, you know, one of the first times that I got exposed to uh, both disease, to, to this disease. Um, so as, as you have described, you know, the cutaneous involvement of Hodgkin's is actually quite rare. Um, and, um, uh, and, 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 the, and, and we probably see much less now than we used to see several decades ago because of the advances in treatment that have occurred in Hodgkin's disease. So um, there's been not only uh, more use of stem cell transplant as a primary therapeutic option in patients that have Hodgkin's, but there's also a lot of biologic agents that have are key and have been approved to use in classic Hodgkin's. Some, some of the two most important examples are Brentoximab vedotin, which is an anti-CD30, and PDL1 blockade. Um, both are approved in patients with the disease. So um, the cutaneous, the, the cutaneous uh, dissemination is actually very rare and happen much less common these days than, uh, than what it used to, uh, uh, you know, many, many decades ago. In regards to what it implies when we see Hodgkin's in the skin, 
we, for the most part, assume that someone who develops skin lesions uh, and have a diagnosis of Hodgkin's in the skin should be essentially diagnosed as stage four. And that is what most of the literature says. There is still, so there are still, if you judge, you know, most patients uh, really are treated based on the amount of disease that they have using the Ann Arbor staging system. And if you look at the Ann Arbor staging system, it is allowed to have extranodal disease in the setting of local regional spread. So there is the possibility where you have disease limited to a couple of lymph nodes in an area of the body and you have local regional dissemination of the skin. And that might not necessarily significantly impact the prognosis of the disease. But based on our series, which is the largest series that has been done in the modern era, of cutaneous Hodgkin's, we encounter that most of these patients have stage four disease at diagnosis, and uh, and of course, you know the pro the the behavior of the disease appears to be more you know more aggressive, just judging, judging by stage. So, if some were not at stage four and they were at stage three, and then a secondary cutaneous involvement was discovered, then that would put them over in stage four? That is, most of the time that is correct. Um, you can, so most of the time is correct. So let's say if you think that the disease, if you had multiple skin lesions mm -hmm. affecting different areas of the body, we assume that that probably represents a hematogenous spread of the disease, in which case, it clearly upstages into a stage four. In the less common cases where it's just local regional skin dissemination, if you had a stage three and you just have local regional embalming of the skin by an affected lymph node, perhaps in that case, you might still, still classify it as stage three. Thank you. Uh, just to remind everyone that the article is free to read for another two months, and there's a, a link on our Dermpath JC Twitter profile. Um, so just like Dr. Gru mentioned, this is the largest uh, case series to date of um, secondary cutaneous involvement of Hodgkin's lymphoma, 25 patients. Uh, my question for you was, uh, was the morphology of the original Hodgkin's lymphoma biopsy in the lymph node the same as the morphology of the secondary cutaneous involvement of Hodgkin's lymphoma for that same patient, or did it change? Yeah, no, that's a great question. And in most circumstances, we identify the same morphology in both the lymph node and the skin. So as you know, you know, classic Hodgkin lymphoma have different subtypes, different variants that we see. For example, not a nodular sclerosis subtype, mixed cellularity subtype, uh, lymphocyte depleted. And there are some variants in, in most cases of Hodgkin's, the neoplastic cells represent a minority of the cells within the infiltrate. So it's a, you have to remember that as a lymphoma, the malignant cells really are a minor component of the total infiltrate as a whole. However, in certain variants of classic Hodgkin's, for example, what used to be called um, syncytial Hodgkin's, which is a subtype of nodular sclerosis, or lymphocyte depleted, there, used, there, there is usually a much larger number of Hodgkin cells. And in our series, we didn't see a predominance of those, you know, of a much larger population of Hodgkin lymphoma cells in the skin compared to a node or higher evidence of more aggressive histologic subtypes of classic Hodgkin's. When I think about the Hodgkin's lymphoma, Hodgkin's lymphoma, the first thing that comes to my mind is the reed Stumberg cells. Um, and uh, what other uh, lymphoprotective entities um, that are primary to the skin can have a uh, reed Stumberg-like cells? 
uh, for us not to be confused with uh, the Hodgkin's lymphoma on the skin. Yeah, yeah. So, so as you know, we've learned more and more about uh, different diseases that can have a Hodgkin's-like morphology. And, and you said it very well, that the classic cell that you associate with Hodgkin's are the uh, ritz sternberg cells, which are those binucleated cells with prominent nucleoli that look like uh, owl's eyes. And that's what everyone sticks in their mind as a, as a med student. So what we didn't know is that Hodgkin's as a disease is a CD30 positive lymphoma. That's a requirement that you need to make that diagnosis. Um, and in the, to that extent, we know that other CD30 positive tumors uh, in the skin are actually quite common and way more common than we see Hodgkin's on the skin. So we have a group of primary cutaneous CD30 positive lymphoproliferative disorders, like cutaneous anaplastic Larsa lymphoma. We have lymphomatoid papulosis with many, many different subtypes within themselves. Um, and those are T cell lymphoproliferative disorders, but we know Hodgkin's is actually, uh, is more of a, is a B cell lymphoproliferative process, not, not a T cell one. So there are other lymphomas that are CD30 positive and are of B cell origin. Among them, things you have to think about are um, EBV positive diffuse large B cell lymphoma, which is a very aggressive disease. Uh, the so-called EBV positive mucocutaneous ulcer that was incorporated into the WHO classification back in 2017. Um, we have also other categories like what it's called gray zone lymphomas, which are hot, which are aggressive lymphomas that have features in intermediate between a diffuse large B cell lymphoma and Hodgkin's lymphoma. Uh, rarely those can be found in the skin. Plasmablastic lymphomas is another process that is usually CD, that, that very frequently is CD30 positive. So I think you have a wide range of things that are CD30, pos CD30 positive and can have Hodgkin-like cells where you have to think about and separate apart from a more uncommon disease yeah. like you know, dissemination of the skin by Hodgkin's. So this is the perfect time now for my follow-up question, which has been very controversial and a lot of people just love to discuss about. As we talked about, secondary cutaneous involvement of Hodgkin's lymphoma is exceedingly rare. So does primary cutaneous Hodgkin's lymphoma exist? Yes or no, and, and why not? And my question would be, does the skin have the right microenvironment for development of the neoplastic cells in Hodgkin's lymphoma? Yeah, so those are great questions and they're very difficult ones. I think you probably alluded to my answer when you said, why not? Um, so I will cite, you know, one of the persons, and I think this was mentioned at the, at the, at the journal club last time when Elaine Jaffe gave her uh, scientific talk at the ASDP a couple of years ago, and she said mm -hmm. that she's never seen a case of primary Hodgkin's disease in the skin where there is no evidence of uh, lymph node involvement. Mm -hmm. And um, I will say the following. I will say a couple of things. One is that I, I don't believe there is such a thing as primary cutaneous Hodgkin's disease or primary cutaneous Hodgkin's lymphomas. I think in some circumstances, you might not find elements of remnants of a lymph node and you can have a large mass where the skin is ultimately affected mm -hmm. and you don't see the lymph node anymore. Um, and, uh, and that could potentially happen. Uh, so that's number one. Number two, I think that 
if you look at the historical data of the largest series that was published back in 1994 by Marshall Caden uh, on the so-called primary cutaneous Hodgkin's lymphomas of five cases, really the main criteria that was used there was the identification of not just co-expression of CD30, but also CD15. And while we know that, that Hodgkin cells typically have expression of both, we also know that a significant percentage of common cutaneous CD30 positive lymphoproliferative disorders have expression of CD15, like cutaneous anaplastic large cell lymphoma or lymphomatoid papillosis. So in other words, I don't think we had enough tools at the time to be able to adequately separate apart mm -hmm. cases that could be considered genuine examples of classic Hodgkin's versus examples of other things that look like uh, classic Hodgkin's. You also have to remember at that time, PAX-5 was not used as a common marker. We do know that this dim pattern of PAX-5 expression is really, really characteristic of classic Hodgkin's. And we typically don't see that staining in uh, cases of ALCL, cutaneous ALCL or LYP. I also want to remind the people that people with LYP and cutaneous ALCL can have local regional dissemination mm -hmm. to an ipsilateral lymph node just because the skin is being drained by lymphatics, that doesn't mean that you cannot have those atypical cells extending or spreading into that yeah. regional lymph node. And that happens. So a lot of times, and I've seen that a number of times in my career, not very frequently, but it happens where someone is has cutaneous ALCL or LYP, has a lymph node, that is CD30 and CD15 positive and is accidentally uh, misdiagnosed as classic Hodgkin's. And we know that's, that's really not the case. Those are just examples of just local regional disease involvement by LYP or, or ALCL. Thank you, that's a wonderful elaborate explanation. Thank you so much. Oh, actually, that uh, brought me a question that I, I'm actually surprised that so the LYP actually can go through the lymph node metastasis. Uh, I, if I, 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 if I remember correctly, there was a paper on mimickers of Hodgkin's disease in the lymph node by Elaine Jaffe, and she included at least one or two patients that have LYP. I haven't seen it myself. Mm -hmm. I've only seen in patients with anaplastic large cell lymphoma. Yeah. But um, as you know, you know, the biology and the clinical between anaplastic large cell lymphoma of the skin and lymphomatoid papillosis, there's a lot of overlap between those things. Sometimes is, you know, we know patients with LYP can develop tumors mm -hmm. that do not go away and could be diagnosed as ALCL. So you have to consider that, uh, or put th those things together in your mind that, you know, there is a lot of overlap there. Um, so. Yeah, there seem to be a lot of overlap and like, uh, like ALCL sometimes express mom, mom one. Yes. And yes. Uh, does uh, Hodgkin's lymphoma express mom one too? Yes, uh, most cases of uh, common classic Hodgkin's do express MUM1. And, uh, and actually, if you know, going back in time, a lot of people used to use in the past a while back uh, MUM1 to diagnose LYP <laughs> and anaplastic large cell. So MUM1 is a transcription factor that is expressed in plasma cells but it's also expressed in activated B cells and T cells. So there is a wide spectrum of things that are MOM1 positive and that includes both B and T cell conditions. So yeah, that's yeah, a very important because we uh -huh. 
Yeah, I, I mean, because the few slides we sell in Walmart can have a very similar. <laughs> of course, of course. Uh, like a PAX5 and all the B cell markers. And exactly, whatnot. exactly, exactly. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. So you have to, you know, have that in your mind that, you know, a lot of things that are activated on large are going to be MOM1 positive. So, in the paper you talked about, oh, I'm sorry, for interrupting. Oh, no, no problem. In the Go paper ahead. you talked about three different proposed mechanisms to explain the spread of systemic Hodgkin's lymphoma to the skin. And I know we touched about one of them a little bit, the hematogenous spread. Um, what is the most likely mechanism that you think is responsible, at least for the 25 patients that you did um, examine in this uh, presentation? Yeah, abso absolutely. So the three modes of, of, of uh, dissemination to the skin, one was the hematogenous spread, as you very well said, and that appears to be the most common one, probably in patients that have multiple lesions in different parts of the body. But as we found in our study, about 56% of patients present with localized lesions, and a lot of them have uh, a pattern. A lot of them have a pattern where the skin is affected in the vicinity of a lymph node. So the mechanism that appears to be more plausible for our data was one where you have direct extension of the skin by an affected lymph node in the site. That's, that's the second pattern. Mm -hmm. this third pattern. The third pattern, which was mentioned historically, is one where you have retrograde extension from a lymph node. So essentially, kind of the tumor goes back mm -hmm. from the areas that it drains and it produces skin lesions in the site. So let's say you have disease in the groin and then you present with multiple lesions in your leg. Mm -hmm. um, so that was the mechanism that historically was proposed as to be the more frequent one. In our cohort, we believe that direct extension appears to be key. And actually, you know, on the side, we did uh, publish a paper uh, with uh, Dr. Tony Subtil, who is now... Yeah. Uh, and uh, in Canada, Canada in isn't it? Colombia. Yeah. And we looked at specifically high grade lymphomas that have local uh, regional spread. So we had, we, we published a series of three patients uh, or two patients, I don't remember now, that have direct, you can see the track directly between the lymph node and the involved skin. And those cases had, you know, imaging evidence of this, the direct extension from, from the skin. We didn't have enough imaging data in our cohort to prove that, but that's what we believe is most likely that happens uh, in these cases. And you said this paper was recently published? Uh, the paper uh, but with Tony was published about a year and a half ago. I think we published early on during the COVID times. <laughs> When we were when we didn't have many cases, and uh, so we were uh, you know kind of trying to find something to get our minds occupied, and uh, so anyway, uh, I'll look it up. It sounds very interesting, and yeah. I'll add it, uh, the reference into the yeah. comment section so Absolutely. that other people can Absolutely. refer to it. I can okay. yeah I can I can you know mention to you right now. Uh, so it's, uh, it, yeah, it, it was published in April of 2021. Um, so, and it's a, it's a series, it's a small, you know, group of two cases with one patient having a gray zone lymphoma with features between Hodgkin's and diffuse large B and another patient with uh, diffuse large B cell lymphoma with local regional skin dissemination. Very interesting. Do we have one more question, Dr. Cha? Yeah, if we, if we can, if I can ask one more question. <laughs> yes. Uh, so I found that from the table of all the cases that um, uh, the Hodgkin's lymphoma in the skin either uh, present in the subcutaneous level or um, when it was not affected, it was uh, listed as non-applicable. 
So it seems like subcutaneous layer is almost always um, involved. And then there was a very interesting uh, feature, the example in the figure, a subcutaneous paniculitic involvement of um, Hodgkin's lymphoma. Uh, can you um, describe uh, more about this uh, subcutaneous paniculitic finding and uh, is it a common finding in the, the skin manifestation of Hodgkin's lymphoma? Yeah, so that's a, that's a great question. You know, we found, uh, we found subcutaneous involvement in half of our cases with Hodgkin's, but I will say that a significant number of our cases did not have, the biopsy did not have enough subcutis. So that's actually what I the, rate, <laughs> the, the rate could be much higher. And that particular case that you are mentioning to is was very interesting because it almost resembles a regular lymphohistiocytic paniculitis yeah. that could be potentially confused with something reactive. And we, we felt that it was necessary to, to present that case to show how, you know, uh, these things that have a low number of tumor cells mm -hmm. and have a rich inflammatory background with a lot of histiocytes can mimic something reactive as well. So I think that's, that's one of the key parts of that figure is showing that some cases, you know, you might potentially, if you don't think about it, you, you might, you know, lose the track and thinking about something inflammatory or reactive paniculitis and not neoplastic. If it looks a little funny, it's always good to do chart check to see what kind of history the patient has or pick up the phone and call the clinician and, and talk to them. Absolutely, absolutely. And the other thing that I think was very important from our paper was that, you know, 84% of these cases had, um, uh, you know, uh, so 84% so, uh, of the patients have stage four disease, mm -hmm. but uh, about 67% of our patients had had skin lesions upon the disease relapse. So we're gonna see more frequently skin lesions in patients who are relapsing, usually after a transplant. So it's patients with aggressive disease. But the caveat is that about 27% of the cases, the skin lesions were present at the time where the initial diagnosis was made. So you have to remind yourself that if you see something funny, yeah something that could be potentially looks like Hodgkin's, you have to tell your clinician that they need to do imaging, they need to, you know, do CT or PET CT, look for enlarged nodes, especially if you're looking at a young patient, right? Because that's the, the, uh, the group of patients where we typically encounter uh, Hodgkin's. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much. This has been so illuminating and it has provided more information than the Dermatopathology Journal Club. It, that hour always goes by so fast and we have so many questions we want to ask, but we were fortunate you were able to join us here and uh, we'll be able to post this on the American Society of Dermatopathology YouTube channel uh, and anyone can watch it for free and re-watch it as many times as they want to. Thanks and I'm happy to you know, provide copies of the article. I know there is a time limit, but I'm, any people can email me at any time and um, I'm happy to send copies. Wonderful, anytime. Dr. Group. Yeah. Thank you Thank so you. much. Thank you. Thank you, you very much. A pleasure, a pleasure being here. Happy New Year. Happy, Happy New, New Year, Year to everybody. Thanks. Okay. Bye. Bye. Bye.